We got to stop and talk about Joker because do we? you're not happy. It's not that I'm not happy. I still, I, no, 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 we, 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 I'm always happy when it comes to movies. First of all, oh, okay. second of all, I don't see the necessity of this film. I've oh, talked okay. about this already and I, and, and I have been one to say things like this and taken it all back. And I have taken things back after seeing a film a second time and gone, what was I thinking? The theory of everything. What was I thinking? Mm -hmm. You know, like. I was like, huh, hum. Then I saw it a second time and I was like, okay, I see what everybody's seeing. Mm. So I just, I, I'm having a little bit of a hard time understanding why this film exists. Okay. So I need to, because it doesn't look like the Joker. Okay. It doesn't seem like the Joker. Okay. You're going to, no. you're going to wrap it up gonna, in one sentence say, for exactly. me, Josh. Do it, Josh. One sentence. Here it is. When you watch this movie, don't pay attention to the DC at the beginning of the movie and don't pay attention to the title and think that instead of him being called Joker, he's called Clown and like throw away any kind of a, a relationship to, to DC, the DC universe and and see if it's a good movie on its own. But how is that possible? I, no, no, no. Wait. OK, hold on. Wait, are we fighting? Is this what you were talking <laughs> about? Is this going to be in the description of our podcast? Paul and this Josh go toe to toe over the down. Joker. Um, <laughs> no. Um, okay. First of all, that's an impossibility. Okay. Mm. Second of all, that's not what my hang up is. My hang up is I just don't see the necessity of a solo Joker film. And if you take away DC and you take away Joker and you take away all of that stuff, then why not just make a movie about a guy descending into mental whatever? Because and Todd Phillips can't get $50 million to make it. Okay. Well, then you have to, for me, understand that I have a history, I was going to say a religious history with these <laughs> characters, and I do. So you're going to hear about Gotham City. You're going to hear about other characters probably who are in the DC universe. I'm not, so, I'm not sure if you are or not. And I could, I, and I could take it all back once I see the film. I just, nothing about this fi film makes sense to me right now it just doesn't i know that there's a backstory to the joker in some stuff the killing joke so forth and there's been other backstories the red hood so forth and so on so i know he has a backstory but this seems so definitive and so specific he's got a specific name he's got a relationship with his mother france uh, francis conroy who's all about american horror story and just fantastic um and i like the director I like the hangover movies, but there's just something I, I'm there's something inside me saying, I think I might be completely wrong and it might be a mind bending, blowing experience. And I'm, and you're smiling like you're hoping that that's what happens. And I do hope that's what happens, but I just, you know, me, I never go into a film with expectations. I'm pretty mm. pure. Even if I've seen a trailer, even if I've seen something, I never go into a film thinking, oh, well, it, it was let down because of the hype. I never say that ever or everybody hated it so bad i was expecting to hate it i never say that i have my own way of seeing films and i'm just there's something that just doesn't make sense to me i can't say it any better than that i don't know i don't know why well i guess and, I mean, and you know they're talking it, it may won venice film festival's yeah. grand prize yeah. and it's joaquin phoenix when is he not amazing mm -hmm. i'm also a little i'm a little on the edge of done just the do not the ne of uh joaquin phoenix always playing these kind of like on the edge psychotic characters where they're so frail and skinny and that boned look yeah. of him with his bent bent back and stuff there's just nothing about this that makes me go what is this so that mm -hmm. might be a good that it might be a good challenge i don't want to diss on a film i've never seen i hate people who do that but i just don't understand this movie and i've said it from day one so mm. i'm not gonna feel bad all right maybe bad a little bit uh, <laughs> well it'll be interesting to see where it lands on your top 10 or if it's on your top 10 next year 
Just Are you making a prediction, Josh? I don't, Are you I don't make Paul, predictions. Josh? I don't do that's your job. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the last movie we'll talk about is um, the, the Lighthouse by Dave Eggers, uh, writer director. And I, I, this movie is like a, you know, kind of like just, it seems like the movie from the trailer is just Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson and that's it. And, but they do, they go through some crazy stuff and they're at a lighthouse and that's it. Like that's the whole premise of the movie. And there sounds like there's hallucinations and all kinds of things. And I was like, I was like, Oh yeah, that, that, that looks like it's going to be great. You know? And he did the witch and all this stuff. And then I realized I never saw the witch. Like I've just, ne- I've heard a lot about the witch, but I never saw the witch. So I kind of, it was I'm determined to to see, I was determined to see the witch and I did end up watching it last night uh and uh the one one big reason why I why I decided to watch it uh before seeing uh, the lighthouse was because I heard an interview with Ari Aster the writer director of Midsommar and Hereditary and Dave Eggers and I think the reason why they got them together it was on the A24 podcast and that's who's released all of their films each of their two films now. Um, so, you know, they had a really good conversation. It seems like those guys kind of really, you know, are are in sync with each other as far as filmmaking is concerned. And since I'm, you know, Shocker. a pretty big Ari Aster fan, especially after Midsommar, I, uh, you know, I, I was like, I need to really, you know, get, get this one under my belt. It is an interesting premise of, of a film, The Witch, and I didn't kind of, I didn't really know what to expect going into it other than it was Anya Taylor Joy's first starring role or first kind of like role that she had a that that she had a credit for which I've seen her in a, a bunch of other things since then even things like Split she was in that that and I mean she was really good in that um you know li- little things like that so I I was and uh I've seen some of the other oh yeah she was good in Morgan too which I saw on a plane I would not recommend like spending hard-earned cash on the movie Morgan, but it's it's fine for watching on a plane or, you know, if you're just, like, vegging on Netflix or something. But, yeah, I, I've been very impressed with, with her acting. And so seeing this movie, The Witch, and, uh, you know, it was late at night, which is probably the wrong time to watch it, but <laughs> it was really... It was, some parts of it were, were kind of rough. And um, I don't know. I, I think that I... I got a sense of style from Robert Eggers that uh, looks like it's going to translate to the lighthouse. And it also looks like it's going to kind of like ratchet up that sense of style. It seems like he may be a little bit more emboldened with his, uh, with, with this, this next film, but the witch was a very kind of contained film and uh, you know, about essentially a family moving out to the outskirts of a, of a community and uh you know trying to make a go at it as farmers and then they all kind of like turn on each other uh once uh one of their children is stolen uh and and so it's i mean it is not for the faint of heart i don't think but uh it's it's solid filmmaking and the the amount of detail that was paid to the uh the the script i guess the how they're speaking and the words that they're saying. I had to turn on subtitles about halfway through. I don't know if you had to do something similar or, or I don't know if you no. watched it in the theater. Or not. Did you see it in the theater? Uh, I saw it in the theater originally wow. and I saw it again after on Redbox, And then I just watched it two nights ago. Awesome. And I'm, I have to say this is a high holy compliment, but I'm done right now with this film. I think like, I am I can't too. See it again. I can't see it again. I was halfway through the movie and I was like, what? It's too powerful. It's too much. Yeah. It's just, it's just my uh, suspension of disbelief is too strong. I can't go there. Like I'm floating off the bed at the end. I can't <laughs> do it. Let me just stop for just a split second. Go back to the lighthouse really quick. I just saw an extended trailer. I don't know what trailer you, you have seen. Have you seen the trailer where they're going back and forth with each other? What, 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 or the, huh, huh, that thing that they're doing. I saw the one where they're talking about like, what did you do with the beans? Like I saw that one which <laughs> just really creepy yeah that's know. the first one okay. the new one well at least the one that i just saw i'm not sure if it's huh or what but like william defoe goes what and then robert pattinson goes what and then they go <laughs> back and forth it's unnerving it's really? so unnerving i don't know yeah and now i just watched the 
the witch again. And I'm like, <laughs> maybe I need to like watch Mary Poppins returns again mm. and cleanse my palate. You know, like maybe that's going to be, um, what's that, uh, ice cream type stuff that you cleanse your palate with. Sherbert. Not- Sherbert. Yes. <laughs> I need some Mary Poppins Sherbert to cleanse my theatrical palate. And the play I'm doing right now is kind of heavy too. So yeah. it's like, ah, I mean, maybe that's where my, ooh, I feel a little crazy right now. just thinking about it all. But, um, so anyway, back to the witch, the language is specific because it's actual dialogue from written word from that time that he Mm -hmm. researched and they don't say anything that they didn't say back in that time for real. Mm -hmm. And that to me is disturbing in itself that the language has progressed that much And it's also interesting to me, I guess maybe the language doesn't bother me as much because I have had to look at a page of dialogue and try to figure out what somebody's saying. And when you're trying to just say thank you to somebody on stage and it says thank you on the script, your mind goes into the five different million directions because when you think about saying thank you to somebody, it never sounds like what you say it when you use it in real life. Mm. It's two words on a page. It's a very interesting phenomenon, but my ear clicks into it really quickly. I don't think I could do the, the, the dialogue as well as they did immediately. I mean, I would try, but I don't, I don't really have a thing for that. It takes me a while, but my ear maybe is twisted to it a little bit quicker because of Shakespeare and all of the stuff. My ear can pick it up quicker than I can put it back out. So, I mean, basically, instead of saying we're going for a walk, they just invert things. Walking, we go, you know, that's just what they do. They Jedi knight it, they Yoda it for the, what is it? The 17th century? Yeah. The 17th century. And so the dialogue doesn't bother me. Actually, the dialogue is so real that it makes it harder to separate from the film when you, when you feel your body and your psyche going, get away, get away, get away, you know, like separate because something's happening to your emotional being that it's being affected deeply by a film like this that you want to separate, but the dialogue just holds you there. So I thought the the movie is impressive on so many different levels because it's really about nothing. When you break the narrative down, it's about nothing. A family excommunicates themselves. Basically the father does because they're not good enough. The town is not pious enough. And then a baby gets stolen. And then the kids think the one well, spoilers well, for the witch. Yeah, everybody just um, goes goes against each other, essentially. Yeah, right, and it just blows up. The 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 one thing that that it that I could see kind of like really close to the beginning was how important. Like this movie is impressing upon the viewer how important community is because this family, the maybe the father more specifically, said, you know, like we can't be around all of you other people because you're not as good as us. You know, I have too much pride. I'm going to bring up all these things that you're not doing right. So now I have to, you know, like you said, excommunicate. Uh, he was speci- he was specifically banished because he wasn't willing to, you know, play ball with the community. And so by doing that, there's all of these unintended consequences. Like, you know, his son looks longingly at his daughter because, like, he's got these feelings as he's growing up you know, and, and, and he doesn't know where to point them. And the, the kids have been taught things like, you know, they've been taught things about a witch and, and goats and how the devil can work through them. And they're, they're taught those things, I think, because they, you know, the parents want to try to keep the kids in line. And in, in, a, in some ways you get a somewhat of a parallel between this film and Dogtooth where, you have a family that's so mm. insular and it's it's for the best intentions but it ends up becoming the undoing of the family and and i don't know i thought thought that was it was first of all it's ingenious and secondly there's there's ways that i mean he he you know wraps in religion onto it um specifically like the the puritan christian religion onto it but really it i think it does boil down to community or the lack thereof and what is expected of children especially back then was a lot more than what's expected of children now first of all secondly what the kids were exposed to was a lot more 
I don't know. It seems like, you know, parents, especially in the United States nowadays, and I'm not a parent, so I can't speak from specific evidence, but it just seems like parents nowadays are trying to protect their children from from the external world as much as they can and prevent them from having to deal with what, whether it's, you know, sad issues or mean people or things like that. These, these children are thrown into that and then given these, given these kind of like, it's a goat that's possessing you through a witch and all the, you know, witch through a goat, goat is possessing you and all this stuff. And they've kind of developed a toolkit of this is what could be wrong. And then that's what they go to when, you know, when things are, are not able to be explained. So um, it, it, the other thing that, the other thing that, uh, that I will bring up is that they're corn fields and I didn't see it, but some of the stuff that I was reading talked about how there are shots where there's fungus on some of the corn and that fungus was known to, to be around during this time and then other times where if you eat corn that had that fungus on it, it would be like a hallucinogen. And so you could actually see things that aren't there or, you know, and imagining just a family, like a group of five people or six people, I guess five, you know, that can talk really, that are all, you know, in hallucinogenic state, what the hell do you think is going to go go on? I mean, it's going to go crazy at some point. You know, people are seeing things and not seeing things and it's, and they're just, they don't have the, they don't have the community to help to, to buttress them as a family. And, and it's, it's all going to fall apart. It just fell apart spectacularly in this film. Well, have you ever been camping at one of those campgrounds where, the campsites are only 20 feet away from each other. Yeah. So you pull in your car. Right. At night, those people seem three miles away mm. in the dark. So imagine actually being in the wilderness, in the dark, unknown, being as believing. And I, there's a trailer on um, IMDb for The Witch with a uh, uh, commentary from Robert Eggers mm. talking about certain things. And he talks about how... When he did his research, that these things like witches and goats being possessed and people being possessed were as if they really happened. Those people back then believed that was true. Those mm. things did happen in their mind's eye for whatever reason. I mean, eating moss covered, moldy covered corn, who knows what, or being so religiously zealot that you can't see through that and your mind twisting in a way that, you know, in the dark, just in the dark makes people creeped out in modern day. And all you have to do is turn on your cell phone, but still it's like, until you find that cell phone, you're like, Oh my God, what is that? Oh, it's just my shoes. So imagine all of that being an integral part of your community as if it really existed. And then you take yourself away from something that can balance like you were saying the community you take yourself away from that community and you have no balancing for them you don't know that that's you know the goat's not really talking to you because your friend's like dude that goat's not talking to you <laughs> you're hearing <laughs> something what's up with that so i find it interesting that a lot of these filmmakers ari aster uh being one that you were just talking about they they have a way of talking about people's belief systems without judging them, but also making a statement about what do you do when you're in a community in the middle of where does Midsommar Somor happen? Where does that Sweden, happen? Sweden in the middle of Sweden and you're just li believing these things and you, you believe it so much so that you believe that somebody who's born with a mental uh, deficiency or has some kind of handicap is actually a prophet. And then you take it from there. It's a statement about people and belief that I find fascinating because it's non-judgmental, but at the same time, it's like, you know, you got to be really careful about where you place your beliefs because things get twisted and it never sounds like they're making a statement about any specific religion or any specific belief. They're just making a uh, statement about how the human psyche can really bend things the wrong way. And I find that fascinating. Let me ask you this though. Why is it spelled V-V-I-T-C-H? There was a word which, but in the 1630s, the W wasn't a letter that was used in English. So the way to represent it in uh, in writing was VV or UU or something something along those lines. 
in writing to, to represent how it's said. When you type it in, did you notice when you typed it into Amazon Prime, you couldn't type it in as W-I-T-C-H? You had to type it in as V-V-I-T-C-H before it oh. came up? Oh, I don't know. I, I watched yeah. it on Netflix, I guess. But yeah, it's that's interesting. So they're really sticking to it, huh? That's interesting. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I mean, good for them. That's what they're supposed to. Is it on Netflix? I think so. Oh, now I'm mad I paid for it. Oh, no. Again. Oh, that's all right. It's like three bucks. I'm not going to trust me. That's the least of my concerns right now. It's a fascinating film because it has a temperature and a feeling and a zone that only I think this director can get out of what he was going for. I mean, you know, writer, director, uh, he takes it on himself, but there's a vibe to this movie that's unsettling. And what's also very interesting to me is that you really don't have a definitive answer to what's what you don't know whether or not. And I love how I love this about certain movies when they tell you everything you need to know in like the first 15 minutes, mm -hmm. because they tell you they're going to the wilderness. Oh, and I love that shot when the, from the behind of the carriage and it's looking through like the slats of the carriage and you can see like the townsmen walking by native Americans walking by and you can see all that stuff that they're leaving behind. It's a great statement mm -hmm. without making anything in dialogue happen. But then the kids are playing around in the field and the kids are teasing the oldest uh, si uh, sister. And she's like, yeah, I am this and I'm going to eat you. Yeah. She basically tells everybody what happens right there. And I'm like, that's brilliant. Of course, you don't notice it the first time you see the film because you just think it's teasing or whatever. And then once you see the film, if you think about it, you can put it all together. But seeing it as many times as I have, mm -hmm. I'm now anticipating. I'm now anticipating certain things. So yeah. it was interesting to, to to see it. It was interesting because the father says stuff that ends up happening later on. The younger son says stuff that ends up happening later on, and it's all right there. And I'm I'm thinking that's pure genius that you give away all of your plot points. But nobody knows that's what you're doing in the beginning of the film. That's brilliant. Yeah, and it's it's kind of like that. I do love movies that are like those kind of like puzzle boxes, and and where all the pieces are in place, and it's just the rest of the movie is putting them together. And and I think that that's that's really cool. And Ryan Johnson does a really good job at that too. And Brick, and there's a couple other. I mean, well, Brick, Bl Brothers Bloom, I think too, um, and Looper to a certain extent. But um, yeah, I I. I think that I, I like those movies that that yeah you can kind of piece them together they kind of go together as a puzzle I, and and David Fincher does a really good job at that uh there's there's a lot of filmmakers out there that are and people might even call them more clinical filmmakers and less emotional filmmakers but I think movies like Midsommar The Witch like these these are these have emotions built into them and and a lot of them have to do with with religion so so that I think is, um, you know, not to be discounted. So let's talk about spoilers. I did have a couple of things I wanted to bring up, but they're definitely spoilery spoil spoilers. So spoilers for The Witch from now on. Side note, it is on Netflix. It is on Netflix. Wah, wah, oh, by the wah. way, it, if you want to check and see if something's on a streaming service, you just go to justwatch.com and uh, it will tell you all the streaming services that it's on, how much it's, it costs, all that stuff. And it's it's pretty easy i go there all the time that says the 30 year old versus the 50 year old i'm just saying like, you know we don't think that quick about things like that uh, we have to okay. be told about things like that anyway well there you go now you've been told um so the kids the the boys scene his death scene where he's kind of laying in their like attic or whatever that is it's like a single shot i don't know if you notice like right as he's kind of professing his faith in jesus which is not really his faith i i I don't know. I have all kinds of thoughts about that. I, I think that, that, you know, in the movie, he's supposedly, you know, he's entranced by the witch or he's consumed by the, by the powers of the witch. So all the things that he's saying, even though they sound right, you know, quote unquote, right to the family, they're not actually things that, that, that the internal thing inside of him may be believing, which is really interesting. But that whole scene is a single shot where he kind of like starts laying down and then he gets up and then he goes back down and then he he ends up passing and then his mom comes in and she's kind of you know doting on him and and you know holding his face and all this stuff and i was like how first of all how many times do they do that cuz that has to be really difficult for any actor let alone someone who's 10 years old or i don't know how that kid 12 years old however that that old that kid is i just thought that was an amazing scene a very difficult scene to do but 
I couldn't even imagine how he would start to do a scene like that, but that kid just knocked it out of the park. I was, it, it seems like it would be a lot easier to do a scene like that where you could cut it up, but he had to go through like three different things all in one. He had to be kind of like lethargic sleeping and then bang, pop up, say this whole stuff, you know, be, you know, kind of active and moving and intensive and then just kind of like go blank all in the matter of 30 seconds or 45 seconds. I don't understand it. That's why I pursue it because I don't understand it. I, and you're right. He's like 12 years old. His name's Harvey Scrimshaw, by the way. Wow. Um, and Kate Dickey is the mother who's fantastic. Mm. Um, yeah, I do. I, I guess that, I guess that's what the definition of talent is. You know, I don't, I don't necessarily understand that word sometimes because I think that's a word people put onto other people, but maybe that's what it is. Maybe that, I be, I've always believed that you are you are born to be an actor and that ability is something born into you but I also believe that you can craft it but it's I don't I don't know if there's a a difference per se once you've crafted it so much that you can become a a natural actor uh by trade if you will if that makes sense but I think that like some sports I was going to say heroes some uh sports people uh, athlete, theater person talk. Thank you. Theater person talking about sports. Athletes are born to play those sports. And I think there are other people who have an ability and then they craft the ability and they become successful in the sport, but maybe it's just a different type of ability. But I actually think people are born with the ability to do these things. They just are, I, you know, how can somebody like Einstein have a brain like he does. He was born that way. So I think that certain actors are just able to transcend. And you're right. What he technically does, if you break it down, what he technically does beat by beat by beat by beat, it seems impossible. And to look at that on a piece of paper, I'd been like, I quit, you know, thank (laughs) you for giving me the role, but I I quit. I can't do it. But Also, there are tools that you learn, just like anything else. There are tools that you learn that can help you get through things like that and develop things. So I, I tend to believe he's probably just really born with an ability because Mm -hmm. it is, I actually, each time I've seen this film now, somebody different has, has stuck out to me. And at first it was Thomason's character that stuck out because she's basically the lead. Mm -hmm. And then the second time was Catherine, the mother. And now this time was Caleb. And I thought to myself, I don't really remember him being as engaging as he was. And you're right. He does have a little bit of a thing with looking at his sister because he's going through pre- yeah. pre-pubescence. He's going through puberty. Yeah, yeah it, it happens. I mean, it just happens. Bodies are bodies. But it's he doesn't have a girl to look thing. at, you know? That's, that's, the, that's, yeah. and that's, no. that's the lack of community right there. Yeah, and it's also that, you know, it's like, it's weird that it's your sister, but it's also body parts. So it's weird. And let's not get into a conversation about it, but it's just the <laughs> yeah. way it works sometimes. And just, it seems like weird and it it's appropriate for this movie because of what you're talking about, but it's not that off center. But so I didn't really, I, I don't really remember his arc from the first two times I've seen the film. And then when he's standing up against the fence after he gets returned from the witch's house, I started to remember what he's getting ready to go through. And I thought, this guy has got it. He's got a hard part here. He's got something rough he's got to do because he's got to sound like the believing son. He's got to sound like the son who wants to be educated. And he, you're right. You know, they're working out in the field and they're tw- uh, the twins are maybe eight, nine years old, if that old. Um, and the oldest daughters, maybe 14, 15, they're not mm-hmm. old children. No. So, you know, and they're doing lots of labor and they have to do it to survive. And you honestly believe that little Caleb can do all of this stuff. Like if the father had to go to the village, Caleb took over as the man of the house and you believe it because what he exhibits in the film that you see. And also that brings me to a side note that I love films that don't show you stuff, but they tell you stuff. And by what people do in the films, you learn that these things have happened in the past, present, and in the future. Like, where did they get all that wood from? Did he carve all that wood out? He didn't bring that, you know, he didn't have all the supplies, but then he talks about going to the village and then he talks about trading with the native Americans and he talks about all this other stuff. And you're like, Oh, okay. So it doesn't have to be explained how he built his little 
farm area, the father and the family, it's all going to be ex- explained through whatever their actions are for the rest of the film. And I love stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I love when you see a shot of, you know, corn uh, gathered together and you know that that's so it dries out just a little bit before they cut it off and it makes it easier to shuck it off and stuff like that. You don't have to be explained that it's just a given same with the way that, you know, they're, they're getting water or they're, uh, they're getting uh, goat milk and that kind of stuff. I love things where it's not like heavy handed. So the, the last thing I, did, I wanted to bring up was the last shot of the movie and the fact that, you know, she signs the book and she becomes a witch and all that stuff. And then she goes to the, where the witches are doing their little dance and crazy thing around the, the fire. And then the witches start to levitate. And then she finds out that she starts to levitate. But then the very, very last shot is just her levitating above the fire. And what, what is that? What does that mean to you? Like, how did you internalize that shot? Well, I, that's, that's an interesting question because the, this time that I saw the film, it seemed much more literal like that which really lived in the woods, that mm-hmm. which really did what she did to the baby, that which really did what she did to Caleb, so forth and so on. The first time I saw the uh, film, I thought the witch was sort of a metaphor and didn't really exist. It's just that that's where their mind was going, mm-hmm. that their mind was being twisted or that that was her fate if she did sign the book and all this other stuff. But I'll tell you this much. The first time I saw the film, if you were to ask me to remember what the black goat does, I would have said that the black goat actually spoke with words coming out of the goat's mouth, the, oh. the real goat. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't happen that way no. at all. All you see is a form behind her, kind of a horn and kind of a hoof. But it's the size of a man, That's sort of. A human, but they make it very human version of the goat. Yes. Yeah, but is it? So mm. it's weird. So this time that I saw it, I thought, well, maybe she's joining this coven. There's a coven out in the woods, and maybe this is how they get people to. Thomason has a natural ability to have witch-like powers, and that that's why they called out to her. That's why they they ended up. Because there's that opening shot when they first find where they're going to stay and they have that tree that becomes the prominent uh, vo- uh, focal point for um, where the baby gets stolen from, where she walks into the woods at the end and just basically everything happens to, in, in front of that one tree. Maybe they get called to that tree because the witch's coven is calling them. I don't know. But you're right. It's very strange that you see all of the – because you don't see but one witch, but then the one witch looks different but I thought that was just because she presented herself differently to each to the, person. Yeah. So she's not going to, yeah, she's going to look like a blob of flesh, shuddering flesh to the twins, but she's going to look semi attractive to Caleb and she's going to look obscure to when you see her with the baby. I thought that was just the way that, you know, whoever was in front of her would perceive her. But then you see a bunch of different witches and you're like, but are there a bunch of different witches? Are they from a whole bunch of different places in the woods? And then you're right. You see her by herself. And so I'm wondering, is it too literal to think that there really were witches? Maybe this is just, you were right. This was a descent into madness because of the choices that this family made. It could be that they ate some funky corn and started hallucinating and you know, we tear each other apart when we're in small, confined areas. And even though they're in this wooded area, they're in a confined area because mm-hmm. sh- they tell the kids they can't go into the woods. Yep. Don't go into the woods. And maybe that's why they created this thing in their mind that it's witches because they just like the village where you create something to keep the kids safe. But is it really existing or does it exist in your head or because you put it out there, does it exist? I don't know. I don't think I have an answer to the last shot, but what do you think? I, I'm still, I mean, I just watched it, you know, less than 24 hours ago. It's still rolling around in my head. There's a part of me that wants to think of this as a, like you said, a descent into madness. And this is just all from, uh, you know, from Thomason's point of view. The last scene is all from Thomason's point of view where she wants to see other, you know, witches around a fire. And then she wants to believe that she's ascending, you know, that, that she's levitating. And then, you know, we see her from, a, uh, cause, cause really a lot of those shots at the end are kind of like from her point of view or like at least from behind her. And then, you know, when we see everybody dancing, 
and then we see there's a close up of of kind of her and, and her reaction of seeing all the other witches dancing around the fire. But then the very last shot is like a really far away shot of her kind of centered in the frame, up in the air by herself. So I don't know if if that's just. I mean, it could be the the director saying, you know, this is her uh her vision that she had for herself being realized, and everybody else is you know out of there they've all they've all died whether it's you know by their hands i mean i could very well see the the father instead of being gored by the by the goat killing himself but thinking he's being gored by the goat he's got an axe he's got sharp things he could totally and you see him constantly uh, using that axe yep constantly yeah and did you notice how that shot got shorter and short, shorter each time the first time you see it it's spread mm-hmm. open and you see the whole uh, kind of a lot of the field and him cutting the wood and then the second time you see it it's uh close in on him and then the yeah. third time you don't see anything but hit the action you don't even yeah. see the axe or the wood or nothing yeah brilliant so yeah it's, it's really well done so i mean you could see that and then obviously what happened to the mother she thinks she's you know breastfeeding the baby but she's just getting beat up by that that crow thing and i mean it's just all that stuff is there there's hallucinations kind of like built into that the kids say that they're talking to uh black philip black what is his name black philip is that i want to say black bart i don't know why it's not black bart but yeah yeah. black philip i want to say black bart i call him black bart it makes me feel better (laughs) okay um i don't know why it just does and so so yeah everybody kind of like has their own versions of these visions and and there's definitely a telling of this film where there are no witches um, but uh, I, I think that it, it's uh, you could also, you know, play into the, you know, the the witch frenzy that's about to happen in the the Northeast, like coming up. I think I don't know when when the Salem witch trials were, but I think they were like close to 1700 and or something like that. So. So, yeah, I mean, this is kind of like a pr- primer for what what will happen in a in a larger scale. Uh, you know, in, in a lot of other communities in in the Northeast. So, I mean, that's. I think that it has. You can read it m- multiple ways and then get something from it each of those ways, which I think is really cool. I, I love the fact that, and I don't know. I haven't done too much research. I don't know if he's gone in and been like, "This is exactly what it means." But I hope he doesn't do that because that would kind of ruin it. Yeah, I don't. I think half of the. I wouldn't say fun, but half of the um, experience is not knowing and only going with what you feel or how you felt about a scene Mm -hmm. and to actually have it articulated that this meant this and this was real and this was not real and this was real and this was this and the witches it's it's a moot point at by the end of the film It, it it matters not what somebody else's interpretation of the film is it matters how and what you got out of it Mm -hmm. and i think that's kind of brilliant because I, that that allows somebody to take what they want. I'm sure there's somebody who thinks out there that there's, you know, witches in the woods and that's actually what happened. And according to some of that um, commentary, that's what people really believed back then. And you're right. It's right on the edge of, you know, a couple of years, of about 30 years from the whole witch Salem mm-hmm. thing, give or take. And uh, so people do have their own take on it. I think that's what makes it brilliant. I think if it was explained or somebody assumed they knew exactly what it meant, that person probably wouldn't have the best interpretation of it anyway, because I don't think this is the type of film that's set up to have exactly it definitive what it all meant. Mm -hmm. And that I think is underappreciated in this country as film goers. People want answers. People want not necessarily happy endings nowadays, but they want explanations of everything. And sometimes when it's not explained, it's much more interesting to me. So mm. I wouldn't want it explained, even if yeah. there was, even if he came out and said, there's a definitive answer to all of your questions. Here it is. I would be like, I don't want to know it. Yeah, I want my same. own interpretation. That's where, yeah. that's where my engineer brain's like, well, that's the only answer. So all the other answers are wrong. And then I'm done. <laughs> so. <laughs> Well, I mean, but, but, but at least you're seeking out somebody's definitive answer. You're not saying what I saw from the movie is the definitive answer of what it is. You're not saying this is what I took and this is the answer to everybody's questions. You're saying if somebody did have a definitive answer and it was the director or the screenwriter happens to be both, 
or an actor's take on it, you would want that as a definitive answer. You're not saying that your take on it is the definitive take, right? No, I'm saying that if if he comes out, if Robert Eggers comes out and says, this is what I meant to to for people to take from the witch, and this is what the ending means, and this is... You know, this is the only option as far as the narrative is concerned. Then, then yeah, then I'm like, okay, well, that's it. There, there's no, there's no other options. You know, that he, that's not what he was going for. Now, people can take whatever they want from it. You know, they can get get anything out of it they want, I guess. But for me, I'm more interested in what the director's vision is. Now, if the director's vision is to put something in place that is able to be dissected in, at, but from different angles. And and you know things can be gleaned from it by looking at it at, at a at a different angle. Then great. But if if the director has a specific reason to make the film and and a purpose, and he wants to get that that across, then I, I want I want to see if I can I want to see if that that works for me or not. And and that would be the you know the difference between like a good movie and a bad movie in a lot of ways is whether that specific director's vision gets gets across to me. But a movie like this, they may come out and say, you know, that's there's a lot of things in there. You can pick and choose what you want to pull out of there and what you want to talk about. But you you don't have. But it it's not like it's all all in or all out. So yeah, I, I kind of like that. So you can check us out on the web at actorandengineer dot com. Uh, you can go to facebook dot com slash actorandengineer, and you can tweet us at actorengineer. We'll see you next time. Thank you.